Hello there. Hello, Luke. This is uh, JJ from Think Bamboo. I'm here in Switzerland and uh, not in the fantastic bamboo uh, background, but uh, great to have you here, Luke. You're in the US and uh, you're gonna, um, we're going to talk about the SEB. I don't know if I uh, say it correctly. Yeah. Correct. And it's it's pretty interesting. Um, it's, um, in my words, like um, ex extreme um, alternative for uh, for um, metal and um, and uh, wood uh, for for building structures. So, uh, hey, uh, Luke, why uh, don't you um, give us a little introduction from from your side, um, and then we we dive into uh, specific topics. That sounds great. It's uh, it's great to be on your podcast, and I really appreciate this opportunity. Well, you know, my background is architecture and. Um, I, I studied in the United States here um, in Illinois. Um, Buckminster Fuller is uh, known around the world for dome structures, and he's the one who started this, the university that I went to, Southern mm -hmm. Illinois University, Carbondale. And um, the research for engineered bamboo began while I was in college and in 2002 <clears throat> into 2003. And um, essentially, I made some prototypes right out of college, and uh, this has been uh, my life's focus for the last 15 years of wow. uh, testing and, and researching bamboo, all the different species, all the different adhesives. And um, I'm actually a second generation architect. My dad was an architect also, so I've been around job sites my whole life. But um, you know, you're the one basically, focusing realized, on bamboo. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He, he, he was kind of disappointed. He's like, you mean you're not going to just focus 100% of your life on architecture? And, <laughs> and I said, no, no, I'm, I'm going to look at this architectural material, bamboo, and, and learn, you know, what I have from you and the world and apply it to uh, the architectural applications of, of structurally engineered bamboo, which is the acronym SEB, -E structural yes. engineered bamboo. bamboo. Yep. And this is like an overall uh, acronym, which is like, I've seen it in other places too, but um, from your publications, I've seen, um, I've seen the most. So that's why I also like kind of asked if you're interested in uh, doing this podcast because uh, seeing, hey, this, this guy really is deep into this. I have to talk to him. <laughs> and um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, it's, no, I, or from my point of view, I was like, Probably this is like, I've seen other similar stuff before, but it was like from China. And um, this is something we just talked before also quickly regarding like the, the industrial um, Chinese um, manufacturing, um, let's say reality. They have another bamboo, the muscle bamboo, and uh, probably you're using guadua bamboo or American bamboo. Cool. Yeah. So the guadua bamboo, for those that don't know, as the, latin american bamboo let's say <laughs> yes um which also grows in florida i believe now <laughs> yes Not, yeah the, the climate change <laughs> the positive side of the climate change maybe that's right <laughs> um but is it is it basically really um like 100 percent guadua bamboo or um are there some other scb um like raw bamboo materials which can be used like like this uh, giant bamboo i have here on, on my background yeah i mean the poles you know the combs of of guadua bamboo have been used for you know centuries of course for building all kinds of things because of its strength because of its durability you know uh whether it's little bridges or larger bridges and, and different things. Um, but the, the focus obviously of my technology and, and Renew Tech's uh, focus is on the engineered process of the bamboo to make it into a, a product that is extremely uniform um, and easily integratable into projects. So um, you probably have like an ISO standard um, for that SEV or are working well, towards that or? Well, you've heard of ISO mainly because those are standards typically um, referenced in Asia. And that's the reason you've probably heard ISO. Um, those are 
you know, there are ISO standards that are referenced in, in Europe, but those are not the standards typically referenced for the building industry. Um, uh, EN95 is an EU norm for timber construction. And that is congruent with the U United States' ASTM 5456, the American Society of Testing Materials. And in 2007, a new subcommittee was established per my request to establish the testing parameters for structural engineered bamboo. And so this happened back in 2007 and through a, a lot of work of some uh, people that are a lot smarter than me, we were able to add it into ASTM 5456. Um, the first time a new material had been added into the standard in 35 years at the time. And oh, so it, wow. it's, it's been uh, 2012. And when, when a material goes into ASTM standards and is an accepted and there's a test parameter established, then it's directly integrated into the International Building Code. And so um, the International Building Code is referenced all over the world. Um, and a lot of, many don't realize, but ASTM is used all over the world, and especially in countries who do not have their own standards. For example, Dubai, the Middle East, you have all of Asia actually references ASTM. Um, you have, they have their own standards, like you mentioned, ISO, but nobody really references those for actual structural applications because they don't have the certified testing equipment and labs um, okay, okay. that are pertinent to ISO. So ISO is a, is a kind of a newer um, effort, I guess, to try to add bamboo to the standard, but the world of structural engineering does not reference ISO in, in, in general. Um, they might include some ISO testing or some parameters, but it's not the core. It's the EU norms, okay, European but, norms, and the yeah. US norms. Okay, but basically you have like already like certifications for that SCB um, material. And I think that that does help probably a lot uh, also to work with engineers and the architects in, from now, now and in the future, probably because they know this is uh, like it's it's certified. It does, <laughs> and and compared, maybe you can say like just a little something um, comparing it to like uh, wood in general, not not the specific wood, but maybe like let's say the 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 hardest wood and and like um, metallic structure. Would it be iron or um, I don't know? Probably Steel. not not aluminium because it's not really strong. <laughs> So yeah, maybe the, how does it compare there regarding um, structural and, and price or uh, av availability? Is it, um, do you have like, is, is that also like an issue? We don't have that much bamboo yet or can't produce that much SEB um, yet? Or what, what's the situation? What's the outlook there? Well, you know, the, the recent kind of changes in the in the market and the economy and, and all of that has actually helped in some ways um, because the cost of steel and aluminum and all yes. these other materials have skyrocketed. So yep. now, more so than ever, our materials are extremely competitive and also competitive with wood because the cost of just um, wood, engineered wood, has also gone up. Mm -hmm. So that that really, you know, kind of levels the playing field a little bit. But what's very specific about um, our industry, the bamboo industry, is first of all, it's six times more renewable than uh, timber forest. Yeah, that's hard to 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 win that. <laughs> so when we're talking about renewability, it's there's plenty of bamboo, and and it's and it's regionally sourced, meaning. The bamboo can come from the Western Hemisphere and be utilized in the Western Hemisphere. Many don't realize, but there's a lot of uh, wood that is, you know, being cut down from all different parts of the world. So a lot of the North American market is utilizing southern yellow pine that's grown in Central and South America and, and then milled in the United States. There's even products that are cut down in the United States. This is pre-pandemic. Um, cut down in the United States, sent to the to China to be processed and milled and painted, like for example, like 
door trim or something like that. There's very large companies that were doing that. They would send shipping containers to China and have it milled and then sent back. All that stuff has stopped because logistically and cost of, of transit and strikes at the ports, um, and then also U.S. and Chinese uh, kind of uh, relations have um, caused that <laughs> to not be as, as uh, effective. So it's actually good in those ways because we control our entire supply chain from the Guadua that's harvested in Colombia and Ecuador, South America, direct shipment to the United States. Um, through our processes, through our lamination processes, which are continuing, we have a long way to go, but are continuing to be more and more automated, mm -hmm. we can produce high volumes of product um, here in the United States. The positive side of this, too, is that the secondary lamination, for example, glue lamb beams that are, you know, when you take a dimensional lumber and glue it together, like timber, mm -hmm. that infrastructure has been very well established in the United States and Europe over the last 150 years. So whenever we produce our lamb stock, we call it the dimensional components, they can then be sent to our uh, strategic partners in, in Germany, in Switzerland, um, in the United States, uh, West Coast, East Coast, secondary laminators, these glue lamb companies can glue lamb our lamb stock components as efficiently and as easily and many times more efficiently than they can uh, sawn lumber. And the reason is because we produce billet stock that's extremely uniform. Um, so imagine you're a glue lamb fabricator typically and you've got to cut around knots, voids, you have imperfections of the logs, you got to cut all that out. So then you have this big pile of materials that cannot go into the press. Mm -hmm. Imagine receiving perfectly uniform lamb stock that's in many cases, you know, we can go up to 610 millimeters wide by six meters long. Wow. A lot of these glue lamb factories and manufacturers are typically utilizing dimensional stock that is um, all different lengths from, you know, eight feet, you know, you know, 1.2 meters to maybe up to three or four meters. And then they have to deal with finger jointing it a lot because they have so many knots and voids. So we're able to produ produce in a very efficient uh, lamb stock component. So there's significantly less waste in a lamb, uh, a glue lamb process to make structural elements. So mm -hmm. that's helped us a lot because like I said, the glue lamb industry has been well established for 150 years. Um, and it's gotten even more efficient with the automations and things like that. Um, from secondary fabrication, when we're talking about cutting all of the, the notches and bolt holes and, and angles and joints, that's all done by robot now on a beautiful machine developed in Germany called a Hundegger. It's a wow. robot that, that cuts, uh, cuts up beams, uh, completely automated. And that automation has allowed our industry to become extremely competitive with steel, aluminum. And when you mentioned aluminum, Aluminum is a very prominent material in the building industry, especially in the United States, as well as Europe, for glass systems. Mm -hmm. in, gl in glass, um, Like windows. Is, that's right. Yeah, yeah. structural yeah. glass, windows, curtain wall is another term. These applications are, um, are typically all aluminum. Well, we've developed a hybrid solution where you have aluminum and glass on the exterior, but it comes in... It's called the Glaze Series on our website if you go there. Um, it's a hybrid. So you have the structural, primary structural element as structural engineered bamboo, and then you have your glass and aluminum hold down components for the glass system. And this is probably um, good if you have like the weather input, <laughs> like rain and UV ray and all that, where the aluminum is probably like tougher than uh, the bamboo uh, or than wood. Absolutely. Same issue with wood, right? You have to uh, paint absolutely. it all the time and all that. So that's a smart way of uh, of doing it. I think here also in Switzerland, it's the best windows currently. You can get, as an example, windows with, where you have aluminum outside because of the weather. And inside you have wood. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a very for good the, example. For the thermal performance, it's better to have a natural material inside. on the inside for that yeah. thermal as opposed to aluminum 
all aluminum is just pulling the heat out of your building. It's extremely inefficient. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 the other very important uh, part. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for mentioning. <laughs> cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. So absolutely. So they're like, basically, there are no downsides. What's price wise? Is it like almost same or a little bit more expensive or a little bit more expensive? You know, the downside is just lack of awareness. You know, people are thinking, okay, bamboo, and then they think China and Chinese flooring, and they're like, okay, so I'm building my building basically out of Chinese flooring and cutting boards. Is that what you're telling me? You know, <laughs> really, so you hear that big... too. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it's a big, I mean, not, not I'm being sarcastic, but <laughs> okay. there's a huge learning curve because when someone hears bamboo, they think of something that they've seen on, on someone's kitchen table that they're cutting up their tomatoes on. Yeah. The key yeah. is, is that there's over 1600 different species of bamboo. The species of bamboo are as diverse as the wood species that you see. Mm -hmm. So if you think of, if you're a wood person, I love wood. Uh, wood species and knowing about wood species. So if you take something like balsa wood, which is this lightweight Very wood nice. that like floats and it's like foam almost. Mm -hmm. And then you take something like mahogany, you know, an exotic hardwood. Mm -hmm. And if I said to you, you know, come on, you know, this is, uh, this is wood. This is, these two are both wood. They're the same. They, I can do everything the same with these two. But they're extremely wood, right? different. One is super exactly. hard. The other, you can, with the nail, you can make a, a dent in the balsa, basically. Or, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you could do it like with your fingernail. Like uh, you, could, yeah. you could crush it. Um, and so that same aspect applies to bamboo. Um, there's all these different species. Some are smaller, some are larger. Guadua bamboo is known throughout the world as one of the strongest, if not the strongest species of bamboo. And, and at least yeah. sorry, there are also like different types of guadua bamboo. So um, depending on the regions you mentioned, also there you have minimum like six different types of guadua bamboo. Um, do you right. know like which types you're using? Or are you using only one type of the guadua or? or um... oh. We've tested a few different species of Guadua, um, types of Guadua, and Guadua angusfolia cunt mm -hmm. is uh, one of the primary species, and uh, maybe I, I, because I have a little German background and he was a German botanist, I kind of lean to that uh, um, that species, but it, um, there are other species, and as far as structural capacity, they're extremely similar. But um, even Guadua, that species, the the Aduaba angusifolia count has like subspecies because you have like the um, um, the bamboo one of the bamboo the Guadua angusifolia count type in in Colombia is like super straight. They use it like as beams, and then there yeah. is like one um, which has like thorns, and it's also Guadua. That's right. That's right. And and it's really I haven't I've just found like local names like in Spanish but no like latin like official scientific names so there's like also yeah. a lack of knowledge it seems like on a on a uh, scientific level there because yeah it's like i mean one really has thorns like this and and is like maybe not so straight and the other is like really like super straight and it's the same type that's officially. right <laughs> yep yeah, and, the, and the, all that plays into it because the uniformity plays a role in how easily we can process it. So we're obviously going after the straightest and most uniform species. And um, per no the patent, <laughs> yeah, no thorns. The thorns are not so much of a problem because they kind of you can come off right in one little process. But yeah, but still, um, <laughs> for the harvesting, still. it's challenging. <laughs> <clears throat> That's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and in 2016 into 2017, I established a, a patent that focuses on the harvest, the treatment, but most importantly, the processing, the milling of the slats to optimize their strength and uniformity. And mm. we call this um, radial lamination. And um, I can send a follow up on it because it's pretty interesting. Um, the best cool, way to yeah. The best way to describe it is to take, imagine a bamboo comb mm -hmm. and it's round. It's like a pipe kind of, right? You have a, mm -hmm. a 
inside diameter and an outside diameter, typically of a pipe. When you specify steel or anything, you have an inside diameter, an a radius, yeah. and an outside. Well, what my patent does is it takes the, the comb, and let's say, I'm going to use inches because, uh, or no, I can use millimeters. Let's say the inside diameter is 50 millimeters. Mm -hmm. Like five centimeters. And the outside, and uh, yeah, or yeah, five centimeters. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So let's say, um, so essentially what, what this patent does is it takes that radius of five centimeters and that radius is on a, is put on a blade. Okay, a concave mm -hmm. blade and a, and a convex blade. So you have that same um, radius of five millimeters is put on the concave blade and a convex blade. The convex blade is cutting out the inside. The concave blade is cutting on the outside. And what we're able to do is optimize the highest performance fiber while matching the radii of the inside and outside. And when we have that slat completed, when we glue them together, they perfectly nest together to create a component. Mm -hmm. And uh, visually, it would make a lot more sense. But yeah, um, <laughs> it will help. Essentially, if, if we can show yeah. some stuff later. <laughs> yeah. What it does is it, as you know, the outside fibers of a bamboo comb are significantly stronger than the inside fiber. And so to optimize strength, we essentially remove the inside fibers as much as we need to, and then only optimize the high strength outside fibers for the structural products. Now, as you know, and we've talked about some of these other applications, the bamboo fiber, whether it's the tops of the bamboo combs, the bottom, the inside fibers can be um, produced into all kinds of different products, whether it's a fiber board or composite uh, types of flooring, as well as um, all kinds of other materials. But for structural pr products, Mm -hmm. We focus 100% on this optimized fiber to get the absolute highest strength. And and you is, you measure that probably then with the ten, I don't know how you call those tests, but where you you look like how how flexible it is or when it starts cracking if you put like a lot of weight on it and all that. Um, that could right. be super interesting if you could share like maybe a video or a photo of that and that we could include that later in the blog post. Um, because yeah, still I think a lot of people have this misconception of bamboo being like this plant in the garden, you know, where uh, maybe the birds are there and it looks green all year. And, and, and yeah. they, they don't have the knowledge yet that this is like, this is like so much um, more flexible towards um, um, how do you say um, like um, uh, what's bending. the word? Bending. Yes. Then, then steel, right? Well, it does. It, it has some flexibility properties, um, but the key structural value that you're looking for in structural design is what is referred to as the modulus of elasticity. And that term, it does mean flexibility, but it also means rigidity. It means mm, yeah. rigidity, how much force can be placed on it to where that it is bending, but it doesn't fail. And then it goes back completely to its normal position. So mm. the modulus elasticity of uh, of a high strength bamboo um, is over twice the strength of your most high performance uh, structural uh, wood species like fir or larch, or um, in the United States we have Douglas fir um, and um, southern yellow pine. That's that's that's, that's that's right. Well, and yep, and so, what about like um, iron or or. Uh aluminum um alternatives See, there <laughs> yeah i mean that's the there's a lot of unfortunately because the industry and i hate to say this but it's a fact because the industry started in china focused on flooring products and and people are saying oh you know it's this green steel or it's as strong as steel okay it's that's all garbage <laughs> that's all garbage because it's not even close to the strength of steel steel is a great material but there's also downsides to steel. All building materials have their pros and cons, but structurally engineered bamboo has very high strength. The difference is what is a very specific uh, attribute is the strength to weight ratio. In the strength to weight ratio, yes, it's stronger than steel, 
because we're talking about however many thousand pounds of steel and it's and it's it's this strong and when i say for example um the modulus elasticity of bamboo is four million psi i'm going to use psi mm -hmm. just to That's, provide yeah. a clear comparative high strength steel is 29 million psi so we're talking about the difference between 4 million to 29 million okay but that's steel when it's milled into these shapes you have i beams and you have square tubes you have all these different shapes of steel the h or the u and all yeah, yeah. depending on the application yeah that's exactly right and so what we're talking about is a solid chunk of bamboo like a square we're not making it into i shapes or anything you can but the most efficient use of it is in its uh, square, um, you know, structural element form. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at that, for example, like in a curtain wall system where you're typically utilizing steel and, um, and aluminum, we can take a cross section of, let's say, 51 millimeters or 50 millimeters by 150 millimeters. And that square element is much stronger than a, a square piece of aluminum, for example, of that size, or even steel. Steel will have deflection because it's hollow. And by the time you up the thickness of the steel wall to get to where you need to be, it's extremely expensive and heavy. So now this is an area where we're talking about thermal performance, aesthetics, uh, and also the, the warm look, uh, which is also aesthetics, obviously, for glass systems. We're talking about a material that has the deflection required uh, resistance. So you have, you know, deflection ratings for glass wall systems, for example. We have a material that easily meets those uh, strength standards, and it's the same shape that you see from the outside. Mm -hmm. uh, the only difference is it's not hollow. You know, it's exactly. a solid component. Yeah. So um, seamlessly, these materials can be integrated into lots of different uh, architectural and, and construction, as well as industrial applications. There um, is actually most exciting... nothing where, where you couldn't use bamboo. In theory, you just have to be able to uh, transform the, the raw material into something useful for uh, the industry or the application like you did with the SEB. <laughs> well, I say that's a very good point. You know, this is a building upon technology. You know, I, I talk about you know, Chinese species and how it started in China and all this. That was about 30 years ago. It's hard to imagine. 35 years ago is when... Very that... young. <laughs> yeah. And so now here we are uh, making these structural products. So everything builds upon itself. My focus, as far as my company and Renew Tech, we're focused 100% on structural applications. And that is, like you said at the beginning, uh, what pretty much, you know, sets us apart from everyone else, you know, uh, many elders have to rely on a business case for commodity applications also um, because, you know, the technology and the knowledge is not there. And that's fine. And there's a place for, for everything. You know, there's so many different products, like you said, that can be made from bamboo in and, and its engineered form as well as its raw form. Um, so, you know, it is an amazing material. It's probably 90% of what you read about it online is actually not true, but... <laughs> People are still excited about it. Is it is still extremely renewable, um, but it's a it's a it's not an easy business. There's a lot of hurdles from testing and fire performance, all these tests we had to do, uh, you know, on and on and it goes so that people and structural engineers can feel good about specifying it. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, that's and, and where probably we are. also regarding from like a critical point of view, we could say, I mean the um, carbon footprint probably is um, is rather high because you have to um, transform the raw bamboo into uh, like light pieces, then glue them all together, press them together, cut them again uh, how you want it. And um, that's probably uh, a lot of energy, uh, just thinking the energy that you, you put in there, right? But then thinking mm -hmm. again to alternatives, I mean, how is the how are the iron beam made? That's like they have they use a, a lot of carbon footprint anyway. Uh, aluminium yeah. also much more with all the um, the mines where they get the raw material. So yeah. uh, bamboo uh, maybe uh, I'll say that some people don't know is like um, a renewable grass. So we just cut normally the mature bamboo poles and we don't cut all the bamboo at once. 
Um, this is something also a lot of people don't know. So That's um, right. basically we're just pruning the bamboo. We're taking away the major parts and the bamboo then has more energy and sprouts more bamboo after the cutting. So uh, we're kind of helping. <laughs> this is uh, yes. beautiful too, I think from a, uh, uh, like maybe philosophical perspective or also to, to compare to the mining operation where you dig a huge hole and you have to really destroy stuff to get um, iron or aluminium. And, and that's probably just very super simplificated because uh, <laughs> probably they, they, they don't just take the iron and the aluminium as piece out and it's there. They have to like transform that with other... Um, uh, stuff and all that so this is for sure much much more uh, sustainable or i'd rather like to use the word regenerative approach that's right and um probably for sure somebody has done some um, calculations regarding carbon footprint maybe it could be interesting if everything is uh, accounted for because uh, mm -hmm. even then even then i believe the the seb would be like on the lowest compared to the other um it is we have run um quite a few calculations and we have numbers that are probably fairly accurate um you know it's, it's evolving quickly as we implement a new machine that's more automated our numbers go down you know so mm -hmm. um but what we where it kind of categorizes is, is um you know it's more energy to produce it than say cutting down a tree and then and then cutting it up to put it into a building of course um, but by the time you start engineering that tree you know it's still a little bit of processing our processing is a little bit more intensive than that but compared to uh aluminum and steel you're exactly right it's it's nowhere close because not only are they mining it out of the ground but then they have to mill it and refine it and and uh and the whole thing. All, add all kinds of yeah processes that are extremely energy intensive including the use of fossil fuels such as oil to produce the product and mill it and everything like that. So there's a lot of uh, energy going into those products to where our materials are, are not even close. So we, we have uh, generated some numbers and I can provide those to you as a follow-up as well. That would be great. We have exactly three minutes left. So um, uh, we have to uh, kind of uh, wrap it up. Um, yes. But um, I think we have, we have some real great um, content here. So I'm very thankful for your time. And um, I don't know if you have some closing words um, regarding the SCB or, or any other bamboo specific things, if you're very welcome. <laughs> no, I would just say, I really appreciate what you're doing. It's extremely important to take an honest kind of third party look at, uh, you know, a, a pure uh, perspective, you know, not some like, lobbied perspective a pure perspective of what is the viability of bamboo um of, of structurally engineered bamboo for buildings and your your work is is extremely important to to share um your knowledge and and to communicate with people that um you do take it really seriously it's it's like a passion for my whole life and i really appreciate this opportunity and um, I hope that we get to uh, speak again on, on more uh, topics. Hopefully, we'll have some cool projects to share about here in the very near future. That would be very welcome from my side, too. Absolutely. Um, it's a short time, but uh, we try to make the podcast uh, to be uh, interesting and people are very busy. So um, we'll for sure think we'll be creating another podcast maybe on some future projects you have. So um we're in contact and uh, thank you again, Luke, for your time and uh, continue. I'm sure it's not easy, <laughs> but uh, it's super interesting there. Um, and I've learned some stuff today. I hope uh, people looking at the podcast will be um, also learning interesting bamboo related stuff. And um, hey, um, wish you a great day there over the other side of the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> a great day to you. Enjoy. And thank you again for your time. Thank you very much, Luke. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.